Well, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, before we get stuck into the topic, let me uh, respond to the rabid curiosity and let you know that I will, with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, be portraying uh, typecast, uh, the professor, and <laughs> also Father Christmas, and also the offstage voice of a rather dozy giant called Giant Rumble Buffin. And those, those three things really sort of summarize what I'm about. Um, so, as you know, we're exploring together Walking with God. And our topic this morning is uh, friends who tell you the truth. And uh, that is a rather clever way of talking about what, in, back in the day, we used to refer to as accountability. Uh, but maybe this is a better title, because we have accountability structurally, sometimes in our work environments. So when I was a teacher, uh, I was accountable to senior teachers and head teachers and ultimately to the government. Uh, when I was employed as a church leader, I had a structural accountability to regional overseers and so on. And here, as a member of the uh, staff at Trinity, I'm accountable to Andrew. Uh, but we're talking about something which is rather broader within the church, though it includes our allegiance to and oversight by those who serve in the local church. Uh, so what I'll be doing is trying to open up for us the scriptures uh, about friends who tell you the truth, but also actually to be doing it. Because uh, as somebody whose calling from God has been to be a pastor and teacher, part of my calling is to be a friend to you who tells you the truth about what it means to have friends who tell you the truth, if you sort of follow where I'm going with that. Uh, so we have this uh, wonderful website, which um, Ollie has put together brilliantly in Kenya and these different habits that we're following. Here's a, a first bit of scripture that we're going to look at from time to time. There'll be some Jesus words later. Uh, Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Now, if we just focus on that word mature for a moment, uh, for some of it, it's a bit threatening or scary. For some who grew up with the uh, King James Version of the Bible, uh, there's talk there about becoming the perfect man. Um, what the, the word involves is a sense of completeness, uh, a sense of wholeness, uh, a sense of um, potential being fulfilled. Uh, so let's think for a moment about our priorities. Uh, of course, pastors are notoriously optimistic when they start preaching about the priority of following Jesus. <clears throat> Sometimes we, we assume that everyone has rushed here because their number one priority, not only for the day but for the whole of their life, is to put Jesus first in everything and to become like him. In point of fact, with our priorities, uh, we, we are always dealing with competing priorities. Uh, so one of the first issues to deal with is, are, are we uh, really intent on, are we even interested in this business of becoming complete? Jesus, at the start of his ministry, if you read in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, talks about God's um, authority, God's kingdom having come, and he says, change your direction. Uh, and, uh, of course, that is, is, is what we are called to do by the gospel. Uh, we are called to allow God's authority to embrace and overshadow us so that his priorities are becoming our priorities. But truthfully, when we encounter that, either on our path towards faith or on our path within faith, we can find this rather disturbing. We can find it rather threatening, uh, letting God into our life to take over and mess around with the things that we've got organized the way we want them to. And, and that's not surprising because the Christian life is an ongoing tension between what we are called to be but what we recognize in reality that we are. Uh, so our first issue this morning will be to reflect 
for a moment or two about what our priorities are. And uh, when I've finished trying to unpack the topic for you, uh, I'll, I'll invite you then again to reflect on your priorities. Are you disturbed by this? Are you threatened by this? Are there things that you, in part, would like to hang on to in your life which you know theoretically are not compatible with being a follower of Jesus, but you enjoy them, <laughs> and so you don't want to let go. There is this decision-making process, but what I, I love in the implications of the word that's there, uh, not only in um, Ephesians 4, but also uh, when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your Father is perfect, it's not setting um, an impossible standard that we know we're going to fail. It's an invitation that we should become all that we could be. The passage in Ephesians goes on to say, then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming, instead speaking the truth in love. Truth, love we will in all things grow up into him. And of course, those of us who have sought to follow Jesus for any length of time will know that there are <clears throat> endless competing priorities and there are endless competing distractions. We do sometimes find ourselves feeling uh, that, that we are not mature, that, that we're like children being shifted around between different possibilities. We hear different flavors of the month of Christian teaching and different people who seem to offer to us that final thing that will bring together our Jesus following into a way that will work perfectly, and then that one doesn't work as well. And then there are people who are offering ways of following Jesus that are simply plain daft, but they're seductive and attractive to us. So priorities are important. Which brings us to an issue of um, some of the problems that we have. Um, one of the major problems will be this. Supposing we have come to the point where it is our priority to walk with God, it is our priority to have healthy habits, it, it is our priority to be changed and in a process of maturing to become what it is that our Father ha had from the beginning of time dreamed that we might be. Suppose that is our intention, how can we know what it is that needs to change? And how can we deal with that with the tension that Jesus, you may remember, draw attention, drew attention to between appearances and reality? He spoke about, um, uh, in the religious life of his day, not making a big show of your praying, not making a big show of your fasting, uh, but doing your business with God in private with God. Jesus talked about rejecting the outward appearance, which is going to get people to uh, say how amazingly wonderful you are. Jesus said, well, if you do that, you've had your reward, that's it. Uh, uh, how instead we might do something privately before God, <clears throat> which is not a matter of our outward presentation, but of our inward reality. Um, so we're going to look at an advertisement for how we might improve our Christian life. Uh, for those of you who are inherently gullible, let me just tell you this is satire. I don't know how many sales we've got from that. There's a wonderful American guy called uh, John Christ, C-R-I-S-T, and do have a look on the net and find some more of his satire. Here, here is the issue. Uh, that will make us smile. But the problems that we have in terms of how we're going to make the changes we think we might need to make include these, that we may not be particularly self-aware. Uh, those of us who are not self-aware are sometimes blessed with a wife who's aware about myself, uh, so that, that is good. Uh, but we need to look inside and understand what's happening. And <clears throat> as someone who's followed Jesus for nearly half a century, I can say uh, with experience, we may fool ourselves about what it is that we should be doing, uh, and we may be deceived about what it is that we should be doing. Jesus talks about this. Um, in Luke and in Matthew, uh, there are some words of Jesus 
talking about how we get the help that we need. He told this parable, can a blind man need a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So <clears throat> if there are those whom you know and see within the life of our church, uh, whose walk with Jesus um, encourages you, then look for their help and teaching that your walk with Jesus might reflect some of the good of that. Uh, Jesus, uh, you will recall, said, why do you look at the sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own. Take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the specks from your brother's eye. So we come to this issue of... Um, friends who will help us to walk as we should. And, and of course, uh, there is a question, is accountability one of the necessary disciplines or habits of the Christian life? Uh, it, it is a, a very wholesome thing and a very helpful thing, uh, and something that for many of us at some stage in our life will be helpful. But if you go <clears throat> back to the classics of Christian disciplines, like Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, you find a clear requirement there for what he refers to as one of the outward disciplines, the discipline of submission. But if you look at some of the more recent uh, writing, perhaps slightly more millennial writing, you find millennials are not being asked to submit. Is that a good thing or not? Um, <clears throat> it depends, of course, on what it is that you mean by submission. But the reality of accountability is this. <clears throat> Not that we should have accountability to any particular human being, even a particularly holy human being within the church. The objective is our accountability to God, that we are taking seriously his program, his purpose, his plan for us to grow as the people that he desires us to be. So how does God provide for it? A third of four alliterative points. Normally it's three from a Baptist, but I'm generous today, you've got, got four. Um, there are many ways that God helps us to know how to walk with him. The first and most obvious of these is scripture. Um, but again, if you've followed this walking with Jesus any length of time, there may be occasions when the meaning of Scripture is not completely clear to us, or there may be times when we have difficulty understanding it, uh, and frankly, we need some help. God also provides, and Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit, who will help us. He will guide us into truth. Uh, he is the one who makes changes within us so that we are growing Jesus-like qualities of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. He is the one who provides gifts for us to be able to do things that we could not otherwise do and know things that we could not otherwise know. So there is the provision of the Holy Spirit, but also in accordance with Scripture and by the gifting of the Holy Spirit, God provides people who will help us by speaking truth to us. So, um, very simple examples. Uh, there are uh, wonderful human beings in the life group, uh, which I'm part, and there are several here. As we have learned over the years to love one another and trust one another, we have learned to become open with one another about the things that we find difficult and to be able to express that within the life group context and hear perhaps different perceptions and responses as to how it is that we should be shaping and molding our lives before God. It might involve a challenge. Have you missed this? It might involve a suggestion. I did such and such and it worked for me. So there are the people around us in life groups and there are people around us within church. If we go back to the Ephesians 4 reading, uh, Jesus gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Uh, so those uh, four or five, if you're a Pentecostal, different ministries that come within the church are a gift from God to you. So he sat here on the front row. is a prissy from Jesus in order to help you to grow to maturity. 
Uh, looks like David's escaped, but he's another one. Oh, there he is, yes, and, and Tim's another. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, that's quite enough. Um, <laughs> present, not a big present, but a present, yeah. Um, so God gives to us people who will help us to see the truth. But if we think about this provision, one of the first things to remind ourselves is that we're not simply talking about the appointment. Uh, the people who have a title in front of their name or a photo out in the lobby. Um, We're talking about the whole of the body of Christ. And there are within the body of Christ those um, who are pastors. They've not been given a pastor title, but they're pastors. If you look at that fourfold list in Ephesians, uh, there are some there who will care for a, a church community as a whole perhaps from an apostolic or from a prophetic gifting. There are some whose whole strength and Jesus' gifting is to bring new people into the church. Uh, There are some whose purpose is to model and guide and enable living for Jesus, and they are Jesus' gift to the church. So when we've settled this issue of our priorities? Are we going to make a serious priority in our life of seeking to walk more closely with God and develop those healthy habits? By the way, healthy habits thing. I'm one of the world's leading authorities on how to restart a devotional time, Um, like the man who's a leading authority on giving up smoking because he's done it so often. Uh, But what, what I can say, looking back on the time that I've been doing this, is something very simple. It is when you follow these healthy habits, these basic disciplines, when you build into your life times of prayer and reflection and solitude and digesting scripture and listening and being, life goes better. It doesn't make it perfect. Sometimes it really sucks trying to follow Jesus because it's hard work. But when you follow the disciplines, perhaps especially when you don't feel like following the disciplines, life works out. So let that be an encouragement to you. To finish with, we'll we'll look at some of the practicalities. How, How do you do this business? Suppose you're one of those inherently private people. I'm one of one of them. The idea of somebody speaking into my life is really quite uncomfortable and threatening. So what are the practicalities? Firstly, Jesus talks uh, about uh, Christians being recognized by their love for one another. So this business of people speaking into our lives is one that is relational and not structural. A little bit different if you're uh, uh, somebody who's employed by a church and has office within the church, uh, then there probably is something structural. So as a Baptist minister, uh, I was always scrupulously careful to feed back to my regional minister, the Baptist equivalent of a bishop, if there were difficulties or tensions or things that I was uh, dealing with in my life. That, That was structural. But actually, in that same environment, if there was something that I was wrestling with in my walk with God, I didn't always feel comfortable to go through the structural route because this would go on my file, you know, uh, even if it was finally resolved. Uh, I remember the first time that I, I wanted to, to deal with, with yeah, one of the bog-standard Christian temptations, the whole questions of, uh, of, of um, sexual distraction and sexual desire and how to deal with it. Um, uh, some nice people at a church in Chorley Wood had befriended us and supported us as a church. Uh, and one of the pastors there, um, uh, I said, that I've got this thing to deal with. They're 130 miles away, which made it much, much safer. And so um, I went and, and, and met a guy called Barry Kissel in a pub. And that was a shock for a Baptist for a start, you know. <laughs> but, but I met Barry Kissel in, in a pub. And, um, and I said, yeah, this, this, this 
constant yeah, thing I'm dealing with is sexual distraction. And I waited for the deliverance ministry or the words of wisdom that would crack this one for me. And he said, well, you just don't do it. <laughs> oh, good advice, good advice. <laughs> but it came relationally. It didn't come structurally, and for that was more helpful to me. The way in which uh, people speak into our lives will probably change. And there, I was talking earlier with somebody who, 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 who was desiring this input, but wasn't quite sure where to get it. And in our lives, this, this will change. Um, when I began to learn a little bit about uh, the prophetic side of Christian living, um, a, a, a very gifted person um, offered to, to give me a little bit of support to this. Uh, so there was a season when I had some speaking of truth into my life about how to deal with these things. <clears throat> and I'd phone him up on the other side of the world and I'd say to him, uh, I'm dealing with this particular issue and this is what I think God is showing to me. And then he'd quiz me about the nature of the revelation and how it compared to other sorts of revelation that I'd had. Uh, and as time goes on, uh, there are different sorts of relational help. Uh, I remember um, uh, quite some years ago yeah, thinking about the, uh, the strength and the stability of my marriage and going to find somebody there who'd talk into my life about that. I'll mention that a little bit later. There needs to be, with this sort of speaking into our lives, a sense of trust and a sense of fit. There are many different ways of shaping our following of Jesus, and you'll probably have a rough idea of what yours is like. And it may or may not be helpful to have input from somebody whose way of following Jesus is a little bit different. But what you do need to know is, is that you can trust them. My experience early on as a pastor, and I think other pastors will have had the same thing, is that uh, people would try out to find out whether I, I was trustworthy. I remember one occasion when somebody phoned my wife, Susie, and said, um, now you're probably aware of that I'm dealing with this and this and this and this and this. And Susie said, no. And, and of course, that was the right thing for her to say, and it was true, because they were phoning to check me out to see if when I had said in a confidential conversation, I'm not going to tell anyone about this conversation unless it means that you or somebody else is at risk. So they, they, they blagged with Susie and said, you know all this stuff I've been talking to Mike about, to check out that I could be trusted. So we need to be looking for and inviting people to speak into our lives who, who are trustworthy and who fit. We need to be careful that we don't let anyone tell us we must be accountable to them. Uh, there was a whole load of uh, stuff going in the 1990s when I was in full-time ministry, uh, and there were books coming out with titles like Spiritual Abuse, uh, because there were pastors who were saying, um, if I'm your pastor, you must tell me everything. But that is not coming out of relationship. That is coming out of structure. That is demanding. Uh, so we need to make sure uh, that we're not developing any accountability relationship with someone who might abuse it. We need in our practicalities to choose somebody uh, who knows us. How, well, I suppose they can speak into our lives prophetically, and I've had times when that has happened from complete strangers. But this basic thing of people speaking truth to us uh, needs to be people who look at our lives and see them. There, there need to be people who actually love us. Yeah, that's the root for this sort of ministry. There are many patterns, ideas, and ways of doing this, uh, and I'm not going to advocate any one of them, or even that you should should take on one of them in particular. Uh, there are helpful things um, within life groups. There are helpful things within prayer triplets. There are mutual accountability relationships. And uh, whatever you find that's going to work for you to get that shining of truth into your life about following Jesus, that then go for it. Um, 
But actually, there's, there's precious little out there. I've spent a, a, a significant part of the last nine months trawling the whole of the Christian environment for useful resources for following Jesus. There's not a great deal that is um, strongly, helpfully written in terms of Christian accountability. There, there are some bits and pieces. There are some self-published things that are available on Kindle. Um, as a self-published Kindle author, I know that's not the highest qualification of writing. Um, uh, so finding something that will help is, is not easy. Um, you may not be aware that our, our, our friends, the Pattersons, uh, contributed to a rather fine book for those in a mission environment uh, called uh, Pact to God, um, which talks in the mission context about mutual accountability, and there are some very helpful thoughts within that. You need people, remember what Jesus said about blind leading the blind and specks in eyes, you need people who have a measure of Christian maturity. Uh, you're not looking for the people who are perfect, because then you're never going to find them. But you're looking for people who you can see over a period of time have made some progress. And with everything that's fed into our lives, uh, something which claims to speak the heart or mind of God to us is prophecy. And prophecy, we're told within Scripture, is to be tested. So if somebody tells us, I think what you need to do in your life is such and such, you don't do it blindly. Uh, you test it, you weigh it before God to see if that commends itself to you. One last thing on, on practicalities, and how, how do you ask people's input? Uh, something I've found very helpful is this simple question, maybe it would be useful for you. Uh, I talked earlier about when I wanted insight on how I could strengthen uh, my marriage relationship with Susie. And there was a really good friend I'd spent three years with uh, at Vicar School, uh, another married couple living in the same block as us. We hung around together. We babysat their children. We knew each other well, and we were the third, three uh, founder members of um, a theological heresy organization in the University of Oxford. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, so, so I contacted my, my dear friend, Mark, despite the fact that he was by then the editor of the Baptist Times and could have published things, uh, I contacted Mark and said, when you looked at our marriage, what did you see? That was an enormously helpful question. When you look at the way that I'm following Jesus, what do you see? And I suppose you could phrase it in terms of where are the strengths and where are the weaknesses. Uh, but maybe you're going to be prompting people down unhelpful. When you look into my life, what do you see? And if it's somebody who knows us, then they can look into our life. And, and they're probably seeing things that are helpful. I had one friend, sadly, um, uh, those of you who are, are part of a couple... You know, this couple-to-couple -couple thing. You have each other around for meals and so on. And um, uh, somebody had noticed that another couple wasn't inviting this couple around anymore. And uh, so they went to them and said, why is that? Uh, and the answer, speaking truth, was we actually found ourselves becoming so uncomfortable about the way you two were relating to each other the harsh things you were saying, the sharp things you were saying. For us, it, it was no longer a time of friendship and fellowship. It was a time of discomfort. So can you find people who know your life, who, who look into your life, and say to them, when you look at my life, or when you look at this aspect of my life, what do you see? Now, Perversely, for a Baptist speaker, we're coming in with a little bit of time to be able to respond. And, of course, when a pastor teacher is seeking to speak truth into people's lives, the people to whom she or he is speaking need time to take stock of it. Um, so, 
we're going to go into one of those times of glorious chaos for which Trinity is famed. Um, and I want to uh, invite you, maybe in silence, to be wrestling with that issue of how serious am I about this priority of walking with God? Maybe that by chance you're sat next to somebody who knows you. You might turn to them and ask for them to give you a little bit of helpful input. You might want to open your eyes and look around the room and see as you look around the room if there's somebody that you just sense a Holy Spirit identification of uh, that might be able to come and speak into your life or indeed a nudge from the Father that there's somebody that you would be willing and able to speak into their life should the Spirit be working in their heart to get you to ask. Always within Trinity, we value praying alongside or over or with people, and you might want to turn to somebody close to you and ask for them to uh, pray for you, that you might have courage and strength in this past, uh, this path, you, you might want to come to the, the front here because there's some other issue which is the priority for your time here with God today and there will always be people willing and able to pray. Um, so if you could have a tame musician or two up to play rather than to sing. Oh, I said tame, but we've got Jamie. There we go. Um, uh, just as a, as a background so that if we're having a conversation... Um, it, it's in a worshipful setting, but not where everybody's going to hear us. Um, if somebody senses uh, a word from the Spirit being spoken to us as a fellowship, uh, as we w will often say, if you're somebody who's an established member of our congregation, we know that you'll speak truth in love, then come and talk with David or Andrew, and we can speak this out. Uh, but there's no rush. There's no pressure, there's no imposed duty, but there is an invitation from God who loves you, created you, has his plans and hopes for you, even if today you would not count yourself right now as a Jesus follower, who wants to draw you closer to him and help you in the process. So you have an open menu an open agenda, Father, by your Spirit. Guide us, help us, strengthen us. In Jesus' name.